So I'm joined today by Chan Sadia, who is the Director of Automation here at AMRIS, and we're going to be learning a bit more about AMRIS and what they do and what Chance does and how they use the echo. And I'm also joined by Jefferson Lai, who's an application scientist um, at uh, LabSite, and LabSite stand in San Jose, about uh, an hour south of So Chance, uh, the Director of Automation, has 20 years of laboratory automation experience across a variety of biotechnology instrumentation firms, including Amgen, Cytokinetics, and Agilent. And he spent the last seven years at Amherst applying industrial engineering techniques to synthetic biology to accelerate the commercialization of renewable chemicals produced from sustainable sources, which is what Amherst is famous for. And he has a BS in chemistry from the University of Colorado. And Jefferson um, focuses on synthetic biology and next generation sequencing applications of the lab site echo. Jefferson is a veteran both of Amherst uh, and of Intrexon, and his work on yeast central metabolism appears in nature. And he has a degree in microbiology from UC Berkeley, which is now a world. So, Jefferson, uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of the Symbiobeta network uses the lab site echo. Uh, in your own words, what, what does this machine do? Uh, so the LabSite Echo is a liquid handling platform that doesn't use tips, it uses acoustic energy to transfer the liquids from plate to plate. And uh, we find that it's, it's being very useful in um, scaling down and miniaturizing um, the assays that are being run, as well as increasing the speed at which people are able to crank through these things. Excellent. Um, so uh, I've seen this in action, and one of the uh, beautiful things is the uh, is the way that it can shoot droplets of liquid in, uh, from a glass plate into into uh, into wells. You've got a new product that just was launched uh, earlier this year. What is that new product? That new product is the uh, Echo Six Five Five T and the Axis Two Point Zero automation system that goes with it, uh, and it was just launched. We've added a couple new features to the instrument, including uh, the, the Z-axis motor for the transducer, as well as the ability to use uh, gross tubes to, um, you can basically hit pick the, the samples that you want from your, your storage system instead of needing to pull out a whole plate and you cross that, you can now hit pick exactly what you need and then put it on the end. Excellent. Um, Great. Uh, so to begin, Jefferson, you have a few slides that you wanted to talk us through. The first is the uh, is the main liquid handler. Yeah. So uh, just to give a quick overview for if there's anybody who's less familiar with the instrument, we produce uh, two, three different models right now, as well as the new 655T that just came out. Uh, the Echo 525 is the most popular in synthetic biology. It transfers 25 nanometers at a time with a flow rate of about five to six nanometers per second. Uh, it's good for transferring uh, master mixes and reagents, as well as precious samples, such as DNA. Uh, and our other uh, instrument is the 550-555, and that transfers 2.5 nanometers, uh, so much smaller droplet size, and it's better for a much smaller time of reactions. Uh, and so to give a quick overview on how the technology works, basically uh, we have a transducer that's coupled, that uses a coupling fluid and uh, we ping basically each well and we listen for that echo. And that helps us determine the height of the fluid and how much fluid is in there. We also look for uh, surface meniscus perturbations and that helps us determine the viscosity, that helps the instrument determine the viscosity of the liquid in there. Um, and so we're able to basically then shoot it with low, low energy that doesn't really disturb uh, anything in your liquid and send it to an inverted plate on top. And that's how we transfer liquids. So I didn't realize, I thought that the, the, the beauty of the echo was just that you can use sound waves to actually shoot the liquid into surfaces, but it's actually that you can use the sound wave to analyze all the properties of the, of the droplet as well. Yeah, the instrument does that before it shoots any liquid. So it, you know, it's critical to understand what the solution is and how much energy is needed to displace it. Okay. Okay. Uh, so quickly, the dynamic fluid analysis is one of our uh, 
make this technologies that we've implemented into the instrument. Uh, and this, as I mentioned before, we look for surface perturbations to determine viscosity. So the user can have any sort of fluids in there, um, DNA, anything aqueous, DMSO, uh, glycerol-based solutions, cell lysates, and the instrument will automatically determine um, the viscosity of that and also calculate the amount of energy needed to eject that drop in. Um, so using this technology, we can really just remove serial pollutions from, uh, from workflows. And now we do what we call direct pollution, where we can transfer as little as 25 nanoliters uh, at a time. And that allows us to basically not propagate serial dilution errors and we can build beautiful standard curves. Excellent. Uh, and so just want to show a couple of pieces. We love supporting uh, our customers and our applications, what people are doing out there. And so a lot of these are available on the last site website. Here we have an application note uh, detailing uh, five piece Gibson assemblies at 500 nanoliter scale. And just as an example, we were able to plate so we can shoot E. coli from a source plate into an inverted omni tray. And so instead of doing your traditional 10 centimeter petri dish plating, we can now uh, compress that into one omni tray. Um, here we have the, the famous and original Amherst paper um, utilizing the lab site echo to do miniaturized, 100 fold miniaturized next terra. Uh, sequencing. We've also put out a Nextera XT application note for uh, people interested in using that application. Uh, we're supporting lots of new applications such as RNA seq, as well as uh, Microbiome Work 16S RNA, as well as whole genome sequencing, and lots more coming down the pipeline. So, excellent, perfect. Um, so, uh, in general, what do you think are the kind of customers that stand to benefit most from using the edge? Um, basically, if there's a high throughput needs to crank the, the design, build, learn, test cycle, the left side echo can really accelerate that by saving a ton of money on the design or the build side of it, as well as speeding up that, that, that iteration cycle. And can can you give an example of the cost savings that you can uh, you can achieve through miniaturization? Sure. In the Amaris paper, uh, they basically quote uh, that the next reaction, when you uh, do it at scale, uh, it's seventy two dollars. Being that we're able to miniaturize that hundredfold, we can get it down to seventy two cents a reaction. Excellent. Okay, so we're now going to move over to uh, to chance, um, and you're going to talk about two topics today. Is that right? Um, well, I'm going to give you first of all an overview of our screen structure pipeline, and then I'm going to talk to you about how we've uh, miniaturized that process and sort of the things that we've made us result. Right. Okay. So chance over to you. Um, all right. Thanks, John. Um, first of all. Uh, just really excited to be part of the first ever Symbiopay to Keep Bell. Um, this is an honor for Amherst. We're very excited to participate. Um, as I mentioned, I, I want to talk a little bit about um, the strain construction pipeline at Amherst, um, and then we're going to go into a little bit of detail around um, how we miniaturize any of the steps within that process and sort of the gains that we've realized um, as a result of that miniaturization. Um, I think the, the real story that I want uh, everyone to take away from this is one of uh, continuous um, improvement. For us, that seed um, started with the miniaturization process and for um, the, the audience members that might not be the same seed, um, but the message is the same. Um, you should always be asking questions, always be looking for um, opportunities to improve your processes. Um, so that's kind of the, the big picture um, I wanted to start out um, just uh, by giving a broad corporate overview of Amaris, who we are, and what we do for those of you who aren't familiar. So um, Amaris is about 480 employees worldwide, and uh, we have uh, about 200 of those dedicated to um, specifically to R&D. 
Um, we have access to over 2 million liters of fermentation capacity. Um, and we're actually one of the few companies that are capable of taking a product from strain design all the way through the manufacturing. Um, that gives us a, a unique uh, value proposition for our customers. And as a result, um, right now there are over a thousand brands with, uh, that are using Amaris ingredients. So our core business strategy relies on engineering microbial factors to convert sugar feedstocks into a wide variety of chemicals. Um, we then go on to produce those ingredients at scale, um, and then we uh, go further and, and commercialize those products either through collaboration partners or um, by formulating and selling our own products. Um, Biosance is probably the, the most visible of, of those product lines right now, and that's one of the fastest growing brands in Sephora right now. And what is uh, Biosance? What are the kinds of products that? that are um, so, uh, Biosance is our uh, skincare company, and that's a, it's actually a, a, a fully owned company of Amherst. They're here, so the Biosance team um, is here working closely in collaboration with the scientists. Um, and do you use Biosance? In your I absolutely use Biosance. Um, my wife <laughs> uses Biosance. I use uh, it as well. I you do? do? I use it, I, I, I do use it. <laughs> um, it's a fantastic <laughs> program. You know, I want to get <laughs> It's a fantastic. I feel it now. I need, I need to use biosense. Oh, yeah. We have you know, skin, we got skin cream, we got eye cream, we got sunscreen now. It's um, yeah, the whole deal. And as okay. I mentioned, it's um, the fastest grown brand in Sephora, which certainly surprised me. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and so the majority of this is, is through yeast, the production of you know, sugar, it is yeast, yeast through molecule. Right. Right, so um, we, we take, we feed our yeast sugar. Um, the yeast is going to you know, break those chemical bonds and basically rearrange that carbon into um, molecules of our choice. Now, in the case of biosance, that main ingredient is going to be just like that. Right. Uh, so, just to drive this point home, uh, right now we have uh, manufactured seven products at scale, and of those seven fermentation products, um, we've commercialized 15 products um, that are direct result of those seven. Um, and that covers a, a diverse range of product categories from health and nutrition to clean beauty, which is the Biosance brand, um, to flavors and fragrances. Um, kind of going back to this, uh, what we were talking about before, we're, uh, we're doing this by introducing a fundamentally different way of, of manufacturing ingredients to the world. Um, we feed our yeast sugar. They convert it into products that we normally get um, either from extracts, animals, or petrochemistry. I think um, Biosance is an interesting example of this because uh, squalane was originally something that you would get from, from the liver of sharks. So um, back in the day, they used to go out and hunt a bunch of sharks, remove their livers, and do the extraction process to get, get squalane. And, and it was a really popular ingredient um, for for the cosmetics industry. Um, not surprisingly, that, that practice became pretty unpopular, um, and that was phased out. As a result, the ingredient disappeared um, as, as the ingredient for the cosmetics industry. Um, by engineering that into yeast, we were actually able to kind of resurrect this product that had disappeared. Um, and now, you know, as a result, it's a really popular ingredient for cosmetics. So um, this approach allows us to create a product that's better. It's a higher, higher purity profile than you get from, from uh, uh, other processes. Um, it has a better cost point, um, and we're using a process that's sustainable at scale. All right, so we just talked about how we're making ingredients in a fundamentally different way. Now let's talk a little bit about our R&D uh, pipeline. Um, we've really been focused on accelerating product development. So you'll note that um, our first products took um, nearly 40 months from initial strain engineering uh, through production. Um, contrast that with uh, one of our later products um, where we're uh, coming in just under seven months from initial strain design through production. So we've lowered um, that product development cost um, we've lowered that time to market, and um, we've also increased our own internal 
uh, product pipeline sixfold while nominally increasing my headcount. This productivity multiplier is a direct result of our development pipeline. So uh, we've integrated automation, data capture, machine learning, and human intelligence into every aspect of our systems here. Okay, so that was the, the corporate overview. Um, now let's talk in a little bit more detail about our strand engineering pipeline. Uh, so just a little bit of background here. Uh, designing and construction of DNA traditionally was one of the most labor-intensive uh, aspects of strain engineering. Um, typically, this would take up to 50% uh, of a strain engineer's time. Uh, thus, DNA design and assembly is a key bottleneck in the strain construction pipeline. That's going to limit our ability to work on multiple mole molecules at a given time. So at Amaris, um, our pipeline increases that throughput um, by nearly, nearly a thousand fold. So we can work on more products and we can reduce that time to market. Uh, so in the following slides, I'm going to give you an overview of the strength construction pipeline. So Strain construction um, can be broken down into four distinct sub pipelines with automated strain design as the input. First, we have the parts creation pipeline, um, and that's where we're going to generate small pieces of DNA. Next, we have the assembly creation pipeline, and that's where we're going to stitch the smaller pieces of DNA into larger assemblies. Uh, we're going to use next-gen sequencing to uh, QC the result of the assembly creation pipeline. And then we're going to transform those assemblies into host organisms. So strain construction starts with strain design. And for the purpose of this talk, I'm not going to get into any detail about the automated strain design process. Uh, but the short story is that uh, once a metabolic pathway is identified from sugar to target molecule, um, a set of designs is going to be created. Um, those designs are going to be translated into GSL code. And GSL code is a, uh, a basically a DNA programming language that, that was developed here at Amaris. That GSL code is going to be submitted to Thumper. Thumper is our manufacturing execution system for this, this pipeline. Um, Thumper, in turn, is going to generate build materials um, for all the parts and assemblies. So um, all the primer orders, all the templates, um, all the robotic work lists, etc. So um, starting with parts, parts are the most uh, atomic element of our pipeline. So we amp uh, isolate and amplify individual parts via PCR. Now the sources of these parts are templates um, they could be assemblies from previous development cycles. They could be parts from previous development cycles. Um, it could be genomic DNA, or it could be genes that we've ordered from an external vendor. Um, as you can imagine, doing, doing this at any kind of scale requires a huge number of rearray steps where you're taking templates and primers and mixing them together in um, reaction wells prior to PCR. So moving on to the assembly step. Uh, once parts have been isolated, amplified, and QC, they can now be used to create an assembly. Uh, again, we have another huge rearraying effort that's going to be required to take all those individual parts and pool them into a well for the assembly process. Um, we use yeast homologous recombination um, for the assembly process. You could use Gibson assembly, you could use Golden Gate, um, you use yeast um, homologous recombination. So at this point, it would be really, really costly to allow faulty assemblies to be transformed into a host strain and then screen. Um, so to ensure fidelity of our assemblies, we're going to QC them via next-gen sequencing. Um, and I might jump between NGS and next-gen sequencing. NGS is short for next-gen sequencing. Um, so uh, next-gen sequencing requires a pretty large amount of material. Um, for the sequencing process. And for that reason, we have to do an amplification step of our assembly. Um, we use something called RCA to do that, rolling circle amplification. Um, and that's really just a convenient way for us to amplify large assemblies. Um, it 
the main benefit to us is that we don't have to do many preps at this step. Um, it's also one of the only robust ways to amplify large assemblies. So for those of you who aren't familiar with um, next-gen sequencing, the first step is the tagmentation reaction. And that's going to be where our long piece of DNA is going to get chopped up into smaller fragments of DNA, about 300 base pairs in length. Um, additionally, adapter sequences are going to be added to um, each end of those small pieces. And that's going to allow us to add barcodes to those pieces in the next step. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. So once the adapter sequences have been added, we can now, we can now attach the barcodes via PCR. Um, the barcodes are what allow us to take all of these pieces from all of these samples and pull them together and run them in parallel um, on the sequencer. Um, and it, it's this multiplexing of samples that is what makes next-gen sequencing uh, such a valuable tool for, for this industry. So it makes it, some, makes it fast enough that we can use it as a QC step, and it also, also gives us a path towards um, an affordable way to do QC. So once the barcodes are added, we actually need to QC that library. So we want to make sure that the tagmentation reaction occurred as expected, um, and we want to make sure that the PCR reaction occurred as expected. So um, we're going to be looking at um, distribution of, of fragment sizes, and we're also going to be characterizing the concentration of the DNA. Finally comes the actual sequencing run. So the, all of the fragments are going to be pooled, the library is going to be diluted, and then that's going to be loaded onto the MySeq for a sequencing run. Um, reads are going to be mapped onto a reference um, sequence, and this is, uh, this is software that we've developed in-house uh, at Amaris. Um, and that, the result of that is um, the depth plot that you see in the, in the lower corner of your screen here. And that depth plot is um, what tells us whether or not an integration uh, or an assembly occurred as expected. Um, this process is entirely automated, so this depth plot is, is just sort of a, a visual for the audience, um, but these, uh, these calls are, are automated. All right, once we've QC'd these assemblies, it's now time to do transformations. Um, we use designer nucleases to do our uh, transformations. Um, what that means is that um, we have a method of doing um, really precise multiplex integrations into a post genome. So that means that in a, in a single transformation, we can take lots of pieces of DNA and integrate them in lots of different uh, loci in a uh, reference genome, in a post genome. Okay, so the next step is going to be the, uh, the first step in our actual physical transformation. So you're probably sensing a common theme at this point. Um, we have all of these assemblies um, in, in just different wells in our sources. We need to rearray those assemblies into um, consolidated wells for the transformation process. Um, again, this is a huge rearraying effort that's required to get all of those source wells into their respective destination wells or Assembly. Um, once that, we call this the donor DNA consolidation step. Um, once that donor DNA has been consolidated, it's going to be mini prepped. Um, now we have uh, and purified. Now we have linear DNA, which is ready for a transformation. So the actual transformation step occurs when the donor DNA is added to the competent cell mixture. Uh, that's going to be plated on to solid media for uh, selection. And then automated colony picking is going to pick that into uh, culture plates, which will then be used for both QC and downstream strain screening. Finally, uh, transformed strains are submitted um, for, for screening. Um, and we're going to do a CPCR, which is colony PCR, um, as our QC method at this point. And that's just a way for us to amplify certain sequences. So we're looking for certain sequences associated with our integrations and the presence of those sequences in um, our CPCR process tells us whether or not the integration occurred as expected. This is just a way for us to, have, to avoid having to do um, a 
whole genome sequence to find out whether we have our integrations at this point. Um, QC failed wells are going to be digitally flagged, um, and those plates are going to pass through, uh, through our entire screening process. Um, the results of those screening, uh, the results of that screening process, the data is going to feed back into the automated design and build cycle the next time around. So we're constantly learning from our successes and from our failures. Okay, so that was the big overview of, of the pipeline. Now let's talk a little bit about uh, miniaturization. So just before we go on, so the overview uh, that you gave is showing that you've got a genetic design, you want to get it inside your yeast cell, and then you want to transform that yeast cell, and then you want to screen for it uh, down the road to see right. the product that it's producing, correct? Right, so the, the, the purpose of the, the, of the design, and I didn't talk about the design piece of this, and you went just due to time constraints. Um, the purpose of the design is actually just to actually introduce a pathway into your host organism that's going to uh, channel that carbon path from uh, what yeast wants to do with it to the product that you're trying to make. So that way, you're doing the design process, actually building that root in a organism. And uh, through the assembly methods that you use, uh, there will be um, many assemblies that are just wrong and correct right, randomly. So you have this method, you're using PCR to, to validate which ones are correct. And then you're going to take those, only those, and put them on the next step of the process. Is that right? Right. So we, we want to make sure that the assembly occurred uh, properly. We want to make sure, so we want to make sure the PCR occurred properly. We want to make sure the assembly occurred properly. And finally, we want to make sure that the transformation occurred properly. Uh, properly. That doesn't mean that um, the design necessarily did exactly what we wanted it to do. So that's all a way just to get these lots of designs into the pipeline so that we can test these designs and allow our machine learning algorithms to kind of deconvolute what designs were good, what designs were bad, and make better designs in subsequent iterations. Right, so on to miniaturization. Um, right, so uh, we talked about the construction pipeline. Let's talk about uh, miniaturization. Um, and, and this is something that's really allowed us to um, really think differently about our pipeline and think differently about all of our pipelines at Amherst and realize some efficiency gains and cost savings that just wouldn't have been possible in the past. So how does miniaturization impact the strain construction pipeline? Um, so put simply, uh, lower reaction volumes mean reduced enzyme cost. Um, Non-contact liquid handling means lower tip usage, so we have less consumable, uh, consumable costs. Um, additionally, the echo is much, much faster than a traditional liquid or air displacement pipe better, and that means our processing times are much faster. Um, and, and lastly, because the echo is inherently more accurate, and, and Jefferson touched on this, um, you've got the closed loop feedback with the echo platform. So we can actually detect um, when a liquid transfer failure happens and we can flag that and we can respond to that in real time. And as a result, we have a higher success rate. Um, so let's talk some actual numbers here. This is the parts generation process. So this is the first step in the pipeline. Um, we've been able to, uh, through use of the, the echo, we've been able to reduce primer costs by 50%. We've been able to reduce enzyme costs by 63%, and we've been able to reduce robot time by 32%. So that's uh, a total savings for, for a part generation cycle of 47%, and we're just talking about reagents and consumables here. We're not talking about labor. Um, so not only have we reduced the costs, um, but we've simultaneously increased the quality and increase the capacity. So that's kind of the, the holy grail. Um, so what you're seeing here is uh, a little bit uh, answers by sorry. Um, it's, it's a little bit busy, um, but uh, this is a control chart from our part generation pipeline. Um, and basically what I want you to pay attention to um, are the two uh, solid lines at the top. You see a blue one and an orange one, and then I've got a box around um, the, uh, and the implementation of the echo-based workflow. 
Um, so on the x-axis, you have cycles. So that's uh, basically time. Um, and on the y-axis, you have uh, both PCR success rate and number of reaction levels. Um, and what this is showing is that the, the blue lines are initial attempts at a, at a PCR run. Um, the orange line is the result of the cumulative result of the initial attempt and the retry attempt. So every time we try to make a part, we're going to try it one time. If it fails, we're going to try to make it another time. So everybody gets a retry. So you'll see at the beginning, first of all, this process from a control standpoint is, you know, what we would define as out of control um, up to when we start to implement the echo-based workflow. Um, from that point on, you can see that the difference between the rest used and the initial attempts really starts to tighten up. So we're getting better at making those assemblies, making those parts on the first attempt. Um, in addition, we're trending upwards. That, that gap is narrowing. And where we are today, we're, uh, we're nearly um, at 100% success rate um, on our uh, PCR, course, uh, PCR process. Um, so additionally, uh, assembly generation. So we talked about parts, let's talk about assembly generation. Uh, one of the key bottlenecks in the assembly generations uh, process is the part mixing step. Um, this is another big rearray process. Um, this used to be a multiple robot, multiple day rearray using a traditional air displacement uh, liquid handler type of uh, setup. Um, We've reduced that by 80%. This is something that we can now do on one machine in a matter of hours. Um, on to, um, this is the next generation uh, sequencing step. This is, uh, Jefferson talked about the, the paper that we, uh, that we produced. Um, that original NextEra protocol came in at $82 a reaction. Um, so for a pipeline like ours, where we're literally making thousands of constructs on a weekly basis. Um, $82 a reaction is not a realistic way to do QC, but next-gen sequencing is really the only way you have of ensuring the fidelity of your constructs. Um, through a grant from DARPA, we were able to miniaturize this reaction, and at the time of the publication of the paper, we had reduced this to half microliter reaction. We're at um, a little over $2.5 per reaction. As Jefferson mentioned in his uh, talk, um, this is, you know, we've continually drive, uh, driven this uh, cost down by further miniaturization. Uh, moving on to transformation. Again, um, the donor DNA consolidation step was a massive uh, rearray process. And similar to the assembly part consolidation step, um, we took a process that was running on multiple robots over multiple days and reduced it to a single robot hour and a half process. Um, and, and that's a really big deal. If you think about a pipeline effort where you, to do this for multiple steps, you got multiple robots that you need up for multiple days. You know, so you lose a robot, not only have you broken this part of your pipeline, but you've broken upstream and downstream parts of your pipeline. Um, and now your schedule starts to slip and really everything falls apart. So you need to find some way to create space to allow for um, failure events to happen. Um, you can't do that when you're leveraging all of your robots to do all these processes. So this was really a sea change for us to be able to miniaturize these reactions. And so next steps. Um, so we really feel like we're just kind of scratching the surface at, at as to where we can apply this technology. Um, from solid media plating, which uh, Jefferson alluded to, to dot lot assays, antimicrobial testing, um, mass spec direct injection, um, really the, the sky's the limit in terms of, of uh, <laughs> two different slides. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> um, really the sky's the limit, the limit in terms of uh, where we can apply this technology. Okay, so just to summarize, I've shown you all the steps in the strain engineering process. I've talked about the, imp the impact of miniaturization at each step. So let's talk about the bottom line. Um, so the bottom line, part generation efficiency, we're seeing a 20% increase in efficiency there. Assembly generation efficiency, we're seeing a 20% increase there. 
capacity. We're seeing a 50% increase there. And um, what you the, the uh, chart you see up in the corner actually shows functionally we utilize a 50% increase in capacity. Um, that chart in the, in the corner there is a CPCR, um, which is sort of a, a, a rough, rough uh, surrogate for our total pipeline capacity. Um, and that's, uh, that's an area where we're seeing 104% increases year over year. So that 50% increase, we're not even scratching the, the, our capacity at that point. Um, in addition, 30% reduction in cost just off, off the top. And again, not talking about labor. So just let that sink in for a minute. Um, we've, we've increased capacity, um, we've increased efficiency, and we've decreased the cost. So the cost of a cycle that was less efficient, running at less capacity, was more expensive than the cycles that we run today. All right, so I just want to uh, acknowledge that this was originally built as a live demo, and I don't want to leave the audience wanting. Um, so what you're seeing here is a time lapse of um, our dual echo platform. Um, we affectionately refer, this, uh, refer to this as the echo chamber. Um, this is doing a, 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 a PCR setup process, and you can see which is, with all of the swapping of the plates, um, just how intensive uh, these rearray efforts uh, can be, and how much uh, speed you can realize when you, when you uh, miniaturize it. Excuse me, miniaturize these processes. So, um, going back to the, my original statement, um, even if miniaturization isn't the answer for you, I hope what I've shown um, will inspire you to kind of rethink some of your own processes, ask quick, critical questions, constantly, constantly be looking for improvement opportunities. So with that, I'd like to thank the audience for, your, for their time. Thank you for your time um, and acknowledge all the hard work um, from the people who really made this pop, uh, possible. So our fantastic automated strain engineering team um, who are constantly looking for new ways to improve the processes, our bioinformatics and software engineering group um, who allow us to drive all of these processes, allow us to capture all the data and learn from all the results of that data. And then of course, my team in automation engineering, uh, the talented people who do the hard work that make my job so easy. Lastly, um, uh, we're hiring. So um, if you care about sustainability, um, if you care about the way um, the ingredients you use are, are produced, and if you're passionate about science and engineering, come join us. We'd love to meet you. Thank you. Fantastic. Excellent. Thank you, Charles. Um, so I'm very curious uh, as to some of the questions that we have online. I see that, we've, uh, that we have a few that have, uh, that have come up here. Uh, I'm just going to go back to the, uh, to the screen here. Um, Kevin, do we, have, uh, do we have the first question? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so hold on one second. We're just going to pass the, uh, the microphone over to, uh, to Kevin. Sure. So, uh, Jen Wang uh, asked, um, how do you analyze the target chemicals in the engineered yeast strains in a, in a high throughput manner? Great question. Uh, that's a great question, and I wish that I had an easy answer for you. Um, I, I don't think that um, there isn't a great generic way to do um, this sort of analysis. I would say that probably the most generic tool that we use is mass spec, um, but uh, as a high throughput process, there are some technologies which we have in-house that allow us to do that in a high throughput um, setting. Um, but I think that's, uh, that's one of the areas where I would love to see uh, more innovation is um, some more generic ways to measure these products. Jefferson, maybe you can uh, tell us a little bit about some of the future products that are going to be coming down the line from each life side, uh, in particular, the Bone Mass Spec tool. Sure. Um, there's, we, we've started to release some news and some uh, alpha, alpha prototypes. Uh, uh, an echo transducer coupled to a, a mass spec, and by uh, firing these fentanyl or fentolator droplets, we're able to analyze three samples per second uh, on uh, a 
the QAnon, basically. That's, sorry, that's about probably two years out from being able to be commercial scale. That's huge. Yeah, that, that brings up an interesting point about integration. Um, I presume that there's a, a range of information partners that, that you work with. Um, can you explain a bit about that? If somebody somebody wants to try out the Echo, what do they do? And then if they want to uh, produce an Echo Chamber or something people is called their app, um, what's the process then? Uh, so we have a, a pretty uh, global and strong applications team, and if somebody's interested in trying the Echo out, we can do typically a one-week demonstration where we, we fly on an instrument and an application scientist. We work on the workflow with the customer or potential customer, sorry, uh, and see and produce some data and see how the Echo can increase the quality of data as well as decrease the cost and the time required to run these workflows. Excellent, great. Uh, Kevin, do we have another question? Uh, yeah, so uh, Tom C says that uh, the use of Echo for single colony plating on Omnitray is awesome. And um, yeah, he asks, is there an application note or a research paper published about that process? Um, we haven't published anything about that process. Uh, we, we should have an application note on the website, uh, labsite.com. You look at application notes, uh, G125 is the, the number of that application note, but uh, it is uh, detailed there. Great. Um, Jefferson, I was reading on the Labsite blog recently about uh, the way the Echo is being uh, used to improve animal research for bio products. I wonder if you could give us a bit more detail on that. Sure. Uh, so a little bit of background on the, the ECHO uh, lab site's been around since 2004, and um, that's where we began was a lot of DMSO-based solutions, uh, and a lot of drug and pharma testing screening for drug analogs uh, because of the, of the small droplet size, we were able to really save these precious materials and test a ton of different uh, analogs. So in traditional models, there's a lot of... Um, Animal, animal models that are required to, 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 to pass these drugs forward. By uh, using the ECHO, uh, these farm companies are able to really dra drastically reduce the amount of uh, animal models that are needed uh, just by size reduction and speed reduction. Excellent, thank you very much. So uh, the, uh, the q and is still open, so if you have uh, extra Q&A that you want to ask, then please just type it in. The, uh, in the box on Zoom. Um, I want to know, uh, Chance, how, um, what, what the lab scientists are doing with their extra time now that the, uh, the, the Echo is uh, speeding up what they do. So, uh, right, are we, uh, we're well, you late, late, we're late along. <laughs> <laughs> we, we definitely have, we're growing, but we're not letting anybody off. Uh, so, I mean, I, I showed in some of those original slides um, how we've managed to uh, decrease time to market um, and increase our product portfolio without adding a bunch of headcount. Um, so that's how these efficiencies, that's how we're utilizing that. So um, we are growing slightly, but we're not growing at the same pace that we would need to, to um, traditionally support these new efforts. So we're used, utilizing that time by basically adding a lot more products to the portfolio and doing a lot more development in parallel. And do the, uh, do the reagent manufacturers hate you because you're, you're buying 70% uh, less reagents, uh, fewer reagents, uh, fewer reagents than you were buying before? Uh, that's a great question. Um, and I certainly can't comment on the disposition of, uh, of some of our suppliers. Um, Curiously, the, uh, uh, there was a, a release that just went out from Illumina that they are phasing out the Nextera XT kit. Um, and that is the one that allows us to do this miniaturization. So um, that's something that LabSite and Amherst needs to have a discussion about. Um, I've, I've heard that announcement as well. Uh, and, you know, Illumina has a new e-based kit and so I'm sure we'll be able to continue to innovate on that front with their new products and 
way to keep this pipeline as cost effective and efficient as possible. We'll figure out a way to make it cheap. <laughs> <laughs> um, can we go back to the uh, when you first started using the echo? And how is it now that you've got it, when we come up to, to do a new automation protocol, how has it changed your thinking in terms of how you might design an experiment or how you might gather the, the data? This is a fundamentally different tool and it allows you to do things at a different scale than you've ever been able to do it before. So how does that change either your thinking or the lab scientists? Um, well, in terms of, uh, I think it's, it is the tool that has allowed us to scale the pipeline. And that's kind of the, that's kind of where we were maybe two years ago of just really sitting there thinking, um, how are we going to double, triple the pipeline capacity and really um, needing to search for a technology that would support that kind of growth. Um, and so um, probably not so much around the design and experiment side of things. Um, but just looking at how can we miniaturize all these processes? How can we take everything that we're doing right now on what we would call an advanced liquid handler, a traditional uh, span 8, 12 style air displacement um, pipe better? How can we take all of those processes and miniaturize them and, and leverage the, the echo for you know, all these processes? It's so interesting. Um, I, I see a lot of opportunity in uh, enabling uh, certain workflows that were too costly in the past. For example, for immunogenesis pipeline, you can now routinely whole genome sequence uh, the strain to make sure, to find out what mutations occurred if after you transform the strain, if anything weird happened across the genome. And people are looking into CRISPR interference, CRISPR I, CRISPR A, uh, to Know, genome wide scale knockdowns or activations of certain pathways. So, by like miniaturizing the reaction, you can really test the entire genome space at a cost effective, time effective uh, scale. Excellent. Uh, we have another question online uh, from Tom Su. And uh, if you're asking a question online, maybe just let us know uh, which uh, company you're at or which institution. You're at or where in the world you're at. Uh, it'd be interesting to know. Um, and uh, Tong asks for amplification of yeast plants is using RCA. Is boiling or zymolase used to break up the cells? Uh, yes. So I, I didn't talk in detail about the kind of molecular biology steps behind there, but um, yes, absolutely. Um, you have to boil the cells uh, prior to proceeding. Great, excellent. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about uh, Synthetic Biology Week, which is happening uh, at the end of September, the first week of October. It's the week of SymbioBeta, and um, there are a couple of workshops happening down at Lab Science San Jose. Um, so if people go to the SymbioBeta website or SyntheticBiologyWeek.com, you can see there's over uh, 25 events that, uh, that are on the website, and we're going to be launching those next week. So if you want to sign up, uh, they're all free, and uh, you can actually go down to uh, the lab site uh, lab. Actually, we might be doing it in uh, at UCSF now, um, and you can uh, and you'll be able to get a hands-on demo and take a workshop in using the uh, using the echo yourself. Um, great. So if uh, we have more questions online, then please send them in. We have um, some examples, uh, some free tickets to Symbiobeta to give out for the best question. Um, I got another uh, question that we uh, that we thought of before, which was, can, can you describe direct dilution and why that's better than serial dilution? What's it used for? And who might benefit from it? Sure. Uh, direct dilution is what, uh, the, what we call an echo process, where traditionally, uh, if you were to build a standard curve, uh, you would do serial dilutions. You'd have your high concentration standard and dilute it down tenfold, hundredfold, whatever you need to build out your standard curve and transfer equal parts volume of each of those solutions. And, you know, it's, it's well known that there's a lot of serial propagation errors that could occur. Even within the tips, uh, you can have your, your standards uh, stick to the tips, mixing issues. It's, it's, it's a very fragile process. And so 
by using direct solution, we basically are able to shoot uh, at 25 nanoliter or 2.5 nanoliter increments, uh, the amount of standard that you need. And so without using tips, uh, so we're able to basically transfer from one source and create your entire standard curve in 25 nanoliter increments to hit the, the targets that you need. And we generate very tight uh, standard curves using that process. Um, in pharma, it's a big deal because uh, people are able to just dose in the drug analogs and build up from that without worry of you know, potential other uh, variation effects of like pipetting or using material elsewhere. Excellent. Um, and um, thinking about how we, we talk a lot about DNA and droplets of liquid with DNA for assembly. Um, can cells safely be trans transported by acoustic energy and what's the effect on normal cell function if you, if you, if you try to put cells to the, to the aircraft? Do you do, do, you do any of that? That's, uh, that would be the um, analogous to the plate functions so we're plate by culture onto solid wood. Okay, I'll put this in. <laughs> Yeah, as far as we've seen, uh, we haven't had any effects on cells. It's very low energy. Um, we've also been asked whether uh, transferring the droplets uh, may shear the DNA, if there's any sort of um, force there, and uh, we haven't seen that, and we've tested that. It's it's less energy than, than the acoustic force used in the covars. It's much less, and so um, we're able to plate cells and recover them and pull the DNA and the plasmids back out of them without issue. Excellent. Great. Well, if no more questions online, then uh, then I think we'll wrap up. Uh, any final comments, Charles? Um, no, just uh, you know, thank you for your time. Um, thanks for the audience participation, and you know, and my message is just uh, continue to look for opportunities to innovate and never let your processes stagnate. Jefferson, any final thoughts? Um, Get in touch with us if you guys are curious, and uh, we'd be happy to, to talk to you and, you know, potentially set up a demo and whatnot. And, yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you, SymbioBeta. Thank you, Amaris, for having me here and giving us the opportunity to interact and talk to people. It's been great. Great. And if people do want to schedule a demo, what's the best way they can get in touch with you? Uh, we have local account managers. Um, you, you should be able to just email uh, any of the lab site emails. It will be directed to your local account manager, and then that person will take over and carry the process forward. Right? Great, and let them know that you heard about it first here. That's in by a better deep dive. Um, so, uh, oh, we just have a note from Tom. He says he's at the University of Illinois, and he has one last question on the limb system that Amaris used to interface echo and traditional liquid handlers. What was the limb system that you used? Uh, so uh, you're, you're probably looking for a commercial, uh, commercially available system, and I would love to offer that to you. Um, everything, uh, all the limbs that we have in-house at Amherst is home built. So uh, these are these are systems that we built um, ourselves to try to systems. Great. Excellent. Um, so next week we are going to be live from Paris. I'm uh, doing a webinar with Simbi City in London, and uh, that's going to be all about the uh, global developments and business opportunities around synthetic biology. So that's going to be a little early for us folks in California next week, 6 a.m. Pacific. Um, but uh, if you want to join us, it'll be uh, a fun time and uh, an interactive session where we'll be going over some of the trends that I've been seeing in the industry and some of the business development opportunities that are out there. Uh, we have a number of uh, Symbiobeta lives coming up uh, throughout the um, throughout the uh, throughout the year. We have Open Trans. Um, we have one with Inco Bioworks. We have one with uh, Kevin. Who else do we have? Uh, Oh gosh, put me on the spot here. Uh, anyway, sign up for our newsletter and, uh, and, and you'll receive uh, the, uh, the days for when those are coming out. So thanks uh, everybody for joining. Thanks again to Jefferson Lai from LabSite and to Chance Elliott from Amherst. Um.